What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode, a special episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, I've been excited to have this conversation with you about the Eternal movie. Um, you saw this Thursday. I saw it yeah. uh, Saturday with AJ. Um, every day, Thursday, Friday, even Saturday morning, I refuse to send you any text to get a sort of one word sort of reaction uh, to this movie. And um, but I'm glad we're finally having this conversation. So the Eternals film. There seems to be some sort of uh, diff, uh, um, feeling towards this film. Um, you can see that in the critic score in Rotten Tomatoes and the audience score. Um, and I understand both sides. And if you want to sort of glimpse as to what we mean be, with regards to our understanding, you can certainly check out the video that we previously did regarding, I think the title was Eternals is Whack, question mark. Um, but we, I, we, 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 we give some good reason as to why we thought this movie may have not been, well, been received as well as we thought it, it, it would have. Although, Brian, listen, I have to say I enjoyed very much this movie, but I certainly had my, my issues with it. There were certain things that I think we've uh, had discussions over what we could see in this film that didn't really give us any indication um, about th those things. I'll just say this, that the X-Men is still far in the future. Uh, um, um, and uh, other things that didn't really happen. And I wish they would have touched upon. Um, I have to say, Brian, me and AJ thought this movie was certainly not top shelf, certainly not terrible. For me, the way I see this movie and how we and how I received it was this is a good foundation towards um, the cosmic aspect of the MCU, and I think they want to. They, they, from what I've heard and what we, and what we've heard, um, that they want to sort of go towards, right? Um, and I think this is a good foundation for this, uh, for this uh, uh, part of the MCU. Um, Brian, I sent you immediately after I saw the film, I said, you know, I really thoroughly enjoyed this movie. And, and you said it had some issues. Um, but there's a good movie in this. There's a good story in this. Right. And you said that the, the editing was awful. I, I want you to sort of talk about what you saw, how you uh, received it. How do you feel about it? Um, can't really talk about the the fan reaction because it, you you didn't have a lot of people in your theater. Um, I did have quite a few, um, similar to what I got in Shang Chi. It, it wasn't, it was it was sort of packed, you know, comparatively to like Black Widow first coming back to theaters and stuff like that, and and even James Bond a little bit more than that. But it, it was a good size uh, audience. Um, and you said the editing was awful. I want you to go a little bit into some of the things you did and didn't like about this film. So I would say my my faith in Arishem is nowhere near as strong as Icarus, but I haven't turned my back on the Church of the Eternals just yet. Uh, that's kind of how I'd sum this up. Um, mm -hmm. This movie is a strange dichotomy of a lot of different things. I would say that by the numbers at last check, it was a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is bad. Mm -hmm. Cinema score B, that is the lowest ever recorded for an MCU film. That's bad. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is in the 80s. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. Box office 71 million. That's a little bit below what Disney had assumed. And Disney tends to be a little bit conservative. So I would call it a 
somewhat soft opening. And I would probably say the reviews are why. The reviews probably cost this maybe 10 million bucks, I would think, on mm -hmm. the on the box. What did what did you think this was going? Or what were what was Disney expecting this movie to, to, to so do? So they uh, they forecast seventy five, but if you look at the history, Disney tends to shoot low because they tend to assume Sundays are much weaker than they turn out to be. That's been a consistent pattern dating all the way back to Iron Man one. Okay. So when a movie comes in below their estimate, you can safely assume that that's a little bit of a soft opening. And I think. And the reviews and the like contrasted to Shang Chi, right, where the initial estimate kept then going up because the word of mouth and the reviews were very strong, such that the final exit number was much higher than they had predicted. This was the opposite. So clearly the reviews had an effect. Clearly the word of mouth was not outstanding based on the cinema score. That being said, I think it's interesting because I go back to you know the year we've had here in the in, in Marvel and Black Widow sits there with sort of a Rotten tomato score of something in the 80s, and this is in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And those two movies are not that far apart in quality. To me, that's my opinion. Okay. I don't think there's a 35 point difference in quality between these two movies. I happen not to have liked Black Widow that much, as you know. I had my issues with this, but as I said, there are things in here that I would come back to see explored. I am very curious to see what Marvel does with this. And I do want to talk about that. So that's my like overarching. I also had now my expectations went down because of the reviews and the, and, and the buzz. So in that context, I do feel like it was a more enjoyable experience because my expectations were lower. Had they been at the level they were at after the first teaser, I probably have a more negative feeling sitting here than I do right now. Um, but you know, I think one of the tough things is I do think this was a step outside the MCU formula. So I can't, for all the times that I've said they should do this, one of the things I've also said to you is they're going to swing and miss on occasion. That's part of taking swings. You're going to, and so I can't kill some of the choices here really because it's what I want them to do conceptually. I want them to try. Mm -hmm. I think this film in some ways tried too much. What it tried, and it tried to be different. And so I do have an issue with critics who, for the longest time, have said the MCU is too boring or too formulaic, then coming at this film really hard and saying, well, this was this was terrible for, for not being the formula. I do have an issue. And there were some yeah. critics who did that, and I have yeah. an issue with that. Because yeah. if you want different, this was different. different. It wasn't perfect, but it was different. I... Uh... Definitely agree with that, that this movie was certainly different. When I was watching this movie, I didn't feel like I was watching the MCU movie. I, I felt like I was watching something else um, in a different world. And, and I'm cool with that. Um, but in order for them to, and I think this is where they not failed, but I think they failed to make the connection. I'll say they failed to make the connection, not just simply failed, but they failed to make the connection with the MCU somewhat. I had this discussion. I, I, I don't know if it was with you or um, when I was with uh, Egghead, but possibly with you. And that was to see, because all throughout the film, you, we, we talk of, they talk about the Eternals um, some of the characters having connections to the humans and falling in love with the human beings. And it would have been interesting to see, like in other instances in the film, if you saw the film, and by the way, this is going to be a spoiler. <laughs> we might spoil the movie. So just let me get that out there. But when you go back to some of the scenes where they, in, 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 in the past, you saw instances of them connecting and saving human lives and things of that nation, they actually form a relationship with other human beings, correct? So it would have been interesting to see those relationships in the event of Infinity War with actual humans vanishing right before their eyes, them knowing what was occurring and seeing them not interfere, seeing those instances where they saw whatever relationship that they had formed with other human beings, seeing their reactions to what 
was happening. It would have been interesting to see. I would have replaced it with that Hiroshima stuff. It was like, okay, you know. I have a real issue with that scene, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it was needed. It's a huge uh, plot hole, too. Yeah. Because it's a huge plot hole because the whole premise that this, this idea is based on is this invisible hand mm-hmm. of these godlike figures who have been among civilizations but have not interfered. Yeah. But he, Fasto says, spoiler alert, that he's, his technology is directly responsible for the atomic bomb. Well, that's the interference where I come from. Yeah. So are you suggesting that the deviants were somehow involved with the Japanese empire in the world war two. And that just like that, that to me was a huge plot hole in this whole thing. This idea of Fastos as Prometheus giving mankind all this tech when they're like, well, we can't interfere. I'm like, well, you are interfering. If you're, if you're pointing them in the direction of all these advancements, you're interfering. So I I actually, that, and that culminated in that moment. And I kind of was like, yeah, I don't get this. But it could be uh, also meaning they couldn't interfere with human conflicts. Um, Well, World War II uh, was not a human conflict. Like that's what I'm saying. Um, Yeah, I mean, you can get deep with it, but we're not going to go there. But I get what you're saying. Um, So there's that. Um. What I was hoping to also get that we didn't get and, wh- and why I say what I say with, go- with regards to the X-Men and mutants is that they, we didn't get any sort of indication to a bunch of stuff with mutants and with Atlantis. I mean, there was a lot of talk about um, there could be some sort of uh, origin to how Atlantis was formed or... Uh, how it was created and and we did and we didn't get that and we didn't get any indication as to the the origin of how mutants came to be or what started it or what could happen um if if certain things had had, had gone a certain way and mutants are now popping up that's perhaps that's still in the in the making and perhaps that may be uh, uh, pointing towards celestials and eternals who knows uh, but we didn't get that. Um, one of the issues that I have with this film is that it didn't need to be that long. No, it didn't. It, it's it, it, edited yeah. terrible. No. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't need to be that long. I know Chloe Zhao is a, a Oscar-winning director, and this is where I think Marvel has had issues with people who are. I guess fantastic at what they do and they sort of um, fall prey to whatever they suggest and want to see in the film and want to do with the film. And they, 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 they tend to get a bad sort of um, uh, acceptance to what we feel is a great Marvel film. Um, this movie, again, this movie didn't need to be that long, Brian. Is So this is what you mean with regards to the awful editing. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on the editing, but I think the thing that you need to understand that I found out afterwards was that this movie was conceived of and shot before Chloe Zhao won her Oscar. It was edited after she won her Oscar. And okay. apparently, she was able to get total editorial control because she had won the Oscar. That, I think, is the one of the most significant backstories to what you see on the screen. Because when I say there's an interesting movie in here, I mean, you're talking about a story that literally spans thousands of years. You are going to shoot an enormous amount of material much of which is going to get edited out. But this cut on screen reeked of someone who was flexing. To me, it reeked of a director who was like, I am going to indulge in the things I want to show you. 
at the expense sometimes of pacing, of stability, of sort of forward momentum. And I wonder, had she not won the Academy Award, whether what we see on screen would have been markedly different. different. Yeah. And in fact, I'm going to say something, and I don't know if you had any of this inkling, but there was to me, at least in its like melodrama and this issue of sort of editing and kind of feeling bloated, there was a whiff of Zack Snyder in this movie to me. It felt a little bit to me just like what I'd be interested to know what he thinks of this, actually. I really would genuinely want to know what he thinks of this movie because it felt very sort of just too much in certain areas in the way that we think of his editing as struggling sometimes where there's too many ideas, there's too much content, there's too much stuff being put up on the screen. I think this movie suffered from some, some of the same thing. They were going they were going for too much at times. They were putting too many different ideas into this view of human history yeah. And it got bogged down. I'll give you a very simple example. One of the things I was most excited about, I told you this in the trailer, was when you get the team together. But in every movie I've ever seen where that's done, that is a fast paced montage. It's awesome. Like you think of Magnificent Seven, Ocean's Eleven, Fast Five. Like these movies are moving you along from character to character. Mm -hmm. This movie went the opposite way. I think Richard Madden must have said we need to find the others like eight times because mm. they were flashing back, they were bogging down, like it lost all movement mm, yeah, of yeah. getting these people back together, together because yeah, they were yeah, taking yeah. so long at each stop. Yeah. And it's like, I'm going to give you the full Bollywood song. I'm going to give you the full history of Mesopotamia, of Babylon. Like, it's, you could easily have cut 30 minutes out of this movie. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah, would have I... felt and moved better. So that's what I mean by. Not Zack Snyder visual, I mean Zack Snyder edit. There's too many ideas in here and they're they're not, in the one hand, they're not being given room to breathe, but then certain things are being given too much room to breathe and it has that feel, as I found out after, of only one voice in the room making all the calls for what you see. And Brian, I had no, we just, I mean, who's going to care, but we didn't speak about this film after we saw it. Not at all. This is the first time we're talking. And and I said what I said is you know you 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 sort of give too much say to people who are you know you, you would say exceptional at what they do with regards to directing or he's a star you know we we got to listen to him to keep him you know Iron Man two Iron Man three you know and and. And, and this confirms what you have said confirms my speculation as to how this movie was 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 done visually. Listen, let's talk about some of the things that we did love about it. Sure. I don't know if there were other things that you did, disliked about it. I think. Oh yeah, there are there are other things. We can get back to those as we go along. But let's talk about the visuals because I think that's that's visually, both, I think for me both good and a little bit of bad. But go ahead. Okay, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say regarding bad. There was there was some sequences where me and AJ just looked at each other like, "Yo, this was dope." Um, like when one of the scenes where Fastos they show Fastos throwing some of his uh, whatever his uh, uh, energy blast or whatever it is that that he was throwing at, at Icarus reminded you of what Chloe Zhao had mentioned before in terms of the manga. Um, um, visuals or, or feel to it. Um, and that certainly was displayed here. Makari, I think she was the highlight for me uh, in her abilities and how they showed that when it comes to speedsters is perhaps one of the best um, visually displayed um, 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 power sets that we've seen done really, really, really well. I really enjoyed that. Um, Icarus, I think his his flight ability, his is. Um, raise his all the abilities, all the visual effects for for his character. I think were done very very well. Um, I liked pretty much all the characters. Sprite was you know, she was Sprite, and I felt for her. I really liked her character, and I understood where she was coming from. Um, and, and I think she did a great job. Um, and it was interesting to see that. Uh, 
that they made her human so that she can age because obviously we can't keep Sprite this way forever. Right. In terms of filming a movie and having her look the way she looks, maybe they can, but obviously she's going to age. So I think I don't know if that was a strategic move or what. But what were some of the things that you you liked? I thought the fight with Icarus was the high point. Oh, yeah, that was dope. The the, the, the combination of speed effects. um, I don't want to call them the gold kind of the gold energy, cosmic energy. Yeah. Yeah. Icarus himself in that moment fighting against them. Yeah. Um, outstanding. And also yeah. the it, it looked great on the beach at sunset. You know, that was a great marriage, I thought, of real world set, real world shooting and CGI. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But so that to me was like incredibly high level. It also was shot in a way that I had a clear sense of what was happening at all times. Like even when Makari is moving Icarus at the sort of the speed of whatever she's moving at. You didn't lose that sense of like what was happening. It was like it wasn't like it was too fast to process what she was doing to him. Yeah. And so I love that. And then you combine that with Thena kind of going into the cave and battling Crow. Um, I, I like that whole sequence. That's probably my favorite action sequence of the, of the movie. I agree with you. I like the flying of Icarus, like the, the way that was shot camera wise, the way he kind of balanced. It looked much better than I, like Marvel flights. I feel like sometimes have struggled with the physics. I've, I've always mm-hmm. felt like actually. Zack Snyder does this better than Marvel does. I thought this movie was up with Zack in the sense of it felt like I was in the air with Icarus, especially when he was battling the uh, winged deviant over the mm-hmm. forest. Mm-hmm. Love Did not love the deviants themselves. I got to say this. I didn't love the CGI artistry of the creatures. I didn't, it, it was kind of what I feared. You know, my issue with this, the mindless, senseless, you know, no dialogue creatures. And I felt like these looked a little bit shaky. I thought the CGI looked a little bit, like the physics looked a little bit off sometimes when they were like in the forest and jumping around. I'm like, mm, I can pretty easily tell that's not really something there. So I, that was yeah. probably the piece of it I didn't love. And I thought the forest in general was, you know, she did everything real world. But I thought for some reason, just the way the set pieces were, any set piece where there was light, I thought functioned better than the forest, which was dark and clouded. Yeah. For whatever reason, it just looked better, at least on the screen that I had. And so mm-hmm. um, I, I applaud her for trying. I actually think it was worth doing it this way because we hadn't seen it done this way. But yeah. I think my feedback to her would be like, you need that natural light setting. You know, she, she, she in the forest, it almost looked like she was like putting CGI in the Revenant. And like that wasn't mm-hmm. quite working for me in, in, in mm-hmm. that scene. So, mm-hmm. but otherwise, no, I thought the visuals were great. And, and actually the non-action visuals look beautiful. I mean, all the stuff that we'd seen in the trailers that they expanded upon from, from Arishem to, you know, kind of the, the Bastos's engineering. I thought that looked really cool. Like all those little touches yeah. um, were, were great. So I actually thought, you know, this was, this was all in like pretty high marks for sort of appearance. Although I found people, some people did not care for that, but I think it was at least gave you a little different palette than the normal MCU uh, kind of stuff. And so I kind of like, I kind of like that aspect. of. It. Let's talk about a little bit more, more what you didn't like, because I, I, I have to say, I, I really did enjoy. I think the only things that I would have to say about this film that I didn't enjoy was the, 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 the length of it. It didn't need to be this long. Um, one, at one point, AJ was like, you know, what's up with all this crying? You know, there's a lot of crying. Well, it's, okay, so this was my thing about a little bit of the Zack Snyder like melodrama, right? That they, okay. DC goes for the tears. They go for the ultra grim, overly serious. And this movie went more in that direction. You know, other than Camille Nanjani, there really wasn't anyone providing sort of a, eh, a little bit of Brian Tyree Henry, but they weren't really providing a lighter touch. So like the Marvel mm-hmm. humor that they pitched in the trailer kind of wasn't really in this movie all that much. Mm-hmm. It was much more serious and meant to be emotional. Oh, yeah. Here's my, but let's go through the characters though. Cause this is where I think the movie, if I had number one, it's the editing. Number two, here's my number two reason why I don't think this movie ultimately works as well as it could. Gemma Chan is 0 for 2 in the MCU, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, you know, she had, she didn't have anything to do with Captain Marvel, but she was the center of this movie in theory. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, she had no chemistry with either Richard Madden or Kit Harrington, which makes almost no sense to me. That seems Mm -hmm. almost impossible. You have the two, you have these two guys from great game of Thrones, right? These two heartthrobs in game of Thrones. And I don't believe that you have a connection to either one. Yeah. And I think that's a real issue because, in an ensemble picture, it's 
her relationships that ultimately have to power this forward. It's yeah. you have to believe when Angelina Jolie comes and says, you have loved these people since you got here. And I'm like, really? I haven't really seen that. Like, I don't really buy that. Like, I, you know, I, I don't think that's earned. And then it's made worse by the fact that I think there were two other relationships in the Eternals that completely upstaged her relationships. My MVP of the movie is Barry Keown. Druig was awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he was, was incredible to yeah, me. He was dope. His sense, his mix of like wry humor, skepticism, but also yeah. his genuine conflict about why can't I help these people? Yeah. I wanted 10 times more of him. And not only that, I actually bought that he had uh, chemistry with Macari because he did. And by the way, yeah. Lauren Ridloff, who actually is deaf in real life, yes. did an amazing job in this movie and like that relationship to me like clicked it was like i I could watch a show about those two i also liked um gilgamesh's uh exactly that's the um, other relationship sacrifice to him you know just being with thena and helping her and making sure that she doesn't go crazy yeah so gilgamesh and thena are the is the other relationship which i think not quite as elite as jurig and makari to me but i bought the caring i bought the sympathy and i would gladly have seen more of the two of them fighting side by side through history and kind of building on that relationship. So yeah. it made the Gemma Chan old chemistry with Icarus and with Kit Harrington all the more difficult for me to process because these other two couples, for lack of a better word, were on screen kind of just upstaging her. So to me, I think it's that imbalance. I, I really just couldn't get past that as one of the central issues for this. And I think, you know, it, may, it it underscored to me, this movie's imagery and scale absolutely belong on the big screen, yeah. but its characters and its storylines absolutely belong on Disney+. Plus. And I don't know how you totally solved that, but that's how I felt after I came out of this movie. I was like, that's what I mean by the interesting thing. I'm like, there's interesting stuff in here. There are interesting strands we didn't pull on. There's stuff we pulled on too much, but... There, there's something here that can be worked with. And Druig Makari and Gilgamesh Thina are two of the most prominent things that I would love to see more of because I thought all four of them, you know, and it's weird to see Angelina Jolie taking the back seat the way she did. Yeah, yeah. But she still owned the scenes that she was in. I mean, her action yeah. scenes were great. And, yeah, yeah. you know, so the, that, that I think is my like core issue number two. Gemma Chan just didn't get there for me as the leader of the Eternals. Yeah, um, I definitely do agree with you that there is a better movie in this in this and that I doubt that we'll get a Marvel cut. Let's call it that way, because it's not Chloe's. We we saw Chloe Zhao's cut, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, another cut of this film that perhaps uh, is better than this. Um, Who knows? I, so I think you might. You but think? So here, I think you won't get it of this movie, but I think you'll get it in terms of what they do with this franchise next. I yes. think it's really interesting that Chloe Zhao has publicly said, I'd love to come back. And Nate Moore, who is the lead member of the parliament on this movie, very publicly said, it is not a priority to make a sequel to this. We don't need to come back to this anytime soon. But in the movie itself, it says Eternals will return. Be back. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to put in front of you, I think there's no chance Chloe Zhao comes back because I think based upon what we've heard now about the editorial control, there's a lot of, there's a lot of echoes of Ed Norton on The Incredible Hulk to me on that one. And I don't think they're going to want to bring her back. But I think they're going to bring the characters back and the franchise back. Yeah. It wouldn't shock me if this goes to Disney Plus for the next go around with a showrunner and a writer and they flesh out some of the side characters and you see the Marvel cut of this done that way. That's my- That'll be interesting. That's my like pet theory right now is that they're leaving the door open to change the format. That'll be very interesting to see if we get a Disney Plus show of some of these characters and if we definitely, and if we get a, a, a Marvel cut of, of this film in the future, who knows? Um, What were your thoughts on the Celestials. You know, sort of TBD. I mean, they visually look great. Arishim looked great. I thought the, um, you know what it did actually was like, 
it made me believe Galactus can work as a gigantic person as opposed to the stupid cloud that we had. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Arishem's scale and then Tiamat, even the bit that we saw and the other Celestials that they showed in the flashback, I was like, yeah, we can do Galactus now. We can yeah. put a guy that looks kind of like Galactus and be purple and whatever, and he doesn't have yeah. to look as silly. Yeah. So I was okay with that. The voice of Arishem was fine. I mean, it's sort of TBD because at the end, he obviously, spoiler alert, he takes the Eternals away and you're kind of like, well, where is this headed? And yeah. you know, I do kind of want to know the answer to that question. So yeah. uh, what did you think? Did you want more from... The, no, okay, I, let me ask you this. What did you think of what seemed to be a departure from the canon of having the Eternals and Deviants basically be robots, like robot constructs, like built in a factory um, yeah. by the Celestials as opposed to sort of more organically created, which it felt like the comics pointed you to? I, I, I would say that, I, I, you know, again, I, I've never really been into the Eternals like that. Um, I certainly found it as a surprise because I I was familiar with the story, but not really interested too much. Um, hence, it sort of I, I wonder how they they're able to, you know, develop feelings and having these emotions. Being when you think about how they were created, right? Um, so that was just one thing I, I, I thought about. There um, were a and, lot of departures from the Kirby. Like I went back and I knew a little bit. I went back and double checked some of the things after I saw what they did with the characters. So the origin story of these, like I said, I, I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about this idea that they're more like artificial constructs as opposed to living constructs. I don't know how yeah. I feel about that one. Yeah. I did like, they, they made a very smart choice, which is in the, in the comics, a lot of the powers are redundant. Like, most of the Eternals can fly. fly Most yeah. of them can shoot cosmic blasts. I like the fact that they specialized them in this yes. movie because it just made it more team-wise believable that they had different yeah. skills as opposed yeah. to, yeah, literally go down the list in the comics, you'll be like, wait, they all kind of do the same thing. Like, yeah. you know? So that was a wise, wise choice. Um, it's but, almost, and not, and not to go on a tangent, but almost like Jupiter's legacy, all, all of them can fly, all of them have yes. uh, strength. All Great of them example. can do the same thing, yeah. Yeah. Great example. So, um, but you know, it was cool to see because because I didn't know that this was happening to them, and they had developed this sort of relationship with these humans, um, and then went rogue. And and based on some of the other scenes that we catch in the end, which I I think we'll get into, um, there are others who seemingly felt at some point the same way towards whatever planet that they were um, assigned um, that they broke away uh, from their quote unquote job, right? Their yeah. mission. So there are more, to, and who knows what more Eternals uh, um, will, will be coming soon again or whatever. What, who knows what that means? It could be a movie. It could be that we'll see more Eternals in, in other films. Um, uh, who knows? But I, I, you know, I think it, it felt more. You felt some sort of their shock and perhaps even pain of understanding that this is just their mission and their minds will be erased and they have to do this over and over again. Well, it's a very it's a very uplifting message about humanity, right? It's yes. this idea that the experience of human of human history, even if painful, even if violent, even if at times intolerant and difficult, is ultimately one that touches these beings to say, this race above all should not be wiped out in, yeah. in the emergence. And I, mm -hmm. I like and that's why I think like Clo Zhao's choice here. I wrestled with this afterwards because the MCU formula version of Earth history that she shows you clearly would have had more nods and parallels to scenes we had seen in the MCU before. And I'd be curious to see. So she shows you Mesopotamia. She shows you Babylon. She shows you, I uh, forget, uh, Central America, uh, South America, Amazon, like kind of like 
there is an MCU formulaic version of this where they would flash back to like Wakanda or they would flash back to Stark Industries and they would shoot a scene where like it was clear that they had a little something to do with like arc reactor tech being developed or Wakandans being able to harness the power of their mountain. Would you have wanted that? Because that would have been more conventional Marvel. Would it made you, would have excited you to see like a little scene of that where it's like, hey, they're hidden, they're invisible, but they're kind of influencing the outcome in a way that you could flash back and relate to. It goes back to what I uh, previously said. Yes, I would have liked to have seen that and because it, it would have brought you back into that world. Again, because I think one of the reasons why it felt like a not a Marvel film was because there was really no... At first glance, no connection. There were as any many of- references to DC heroes as there were to Marvel. Ones. Exactly. Um, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, because they went back to different places in time and different events, it would have, like I said before, it would have been great to see going back to the snap, going back to that moment um, again to show those relationships being formed and, and then because of Thanos, it being that should have been the heartfelt moment you you should have seen from the Eternals and, and not the Hiroshima, that thing that we got, you know, that we didn't really need to see that that moment would have probably been better suited for that event um, than what we saw in, in the film. I, that's just a, a, a huge opportunity, Miss Brian. It's one of those where I think what I settled on was I think I would have done a mix. I think if you had done all flashback scenes as former MCU scenes, it would have felt a little too constrained by the Marvel Mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been cool to stick at least one in there. Yeah, I just had this in my mind of like you're doing, if anything, it would be like, again, if you were sequencing and tightening up the pacing of these flashbacks, to be like, all right, we're at this point in history, this point in history. And then if they showed, you know what I mean? They showed like, well, I guess what year would have this, what would it, what's, what year was the snap supposed to be? 2017, 2018, like in, yeah. in Marvel universe, it was around mm-hmm. there, right? If mm-hmm. they had shown like, you're right, the battle of Wakanda in infinity war or something like that, I think that would have gotten a reaction without it being too Marvel. It would have been awe. It would have been awe. It would have been an old snap moment. It would have been a moment that you remember and again, reconnect to the Marvel universe. And well, I also remember what- too, because at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the mission, the mission statement was really about population growth. Yeah. In a twisted way, they were really rooting for, the, for Thor to go for the head because the snap destroyed half the population, which yeah. was hugely de- detrimental to Arishem's goal. So in a weird way at that time, they would have been all in on the Avengers winning that battle yeah. for very selfish reasons, which is to keep the population up so they <laughs> can start the emergency. So yeah, I, that was the one I settled on is like, would have been, there's a way to shoot that. I think that would have been kind of cool and Marvel would have definitely like been all for it, but yeah. she clearly wanted to stay well clear of that as i said there were you know references to batman and superman just as often as there were to you know uh iron man and captain america you know so it's a choice yeah i think this is one of those instances and we've and and as we've already said that you know when you give someone too much control i guess you lose a little bit of yourself and you and well you get what you get right like it could be great but it yeah. would be a mess. And I think in this case, you got a little more mess than great. Do you feel like Marvel is going to sort of steer clear of this, um, I guess, feeling of having to let someone, no matter how great they are, what they do, and let them do their thing? Or, listen, this is the story we want to tell. We want you to direct it so that we can get whatever emotions, whatever it is that we want to get. But we want to include these sort of scenes or these connections and we want to maintain it um, for the MCU. Does Marvel have to continuously have to bow down, I'd say, to 
these individuals who want to do what they do or else they won't, they won't do it. Look, I mean, it's, my, it's in some ways my biggest fear, as I mentioned to you last time, is that the reaction to this or if the box office proves disappointing in the end, that, that it causes them to tighten up because then there will be very talented filmmakers who won't want to be a part of, of the enterprise. Um, and I think that's that would be unfortunate. But, mm. you know, I think if Marvel is going to give more of the creative freedom, let's put it this way. We, we don't know exactly what the line is, but the, the, the word is that Ryan Coogler had a fair amount of autonomy on Black Panther. So there's the other end of the spectrum, right? There's a yeah. guy who you gave him a lot of the control and he delivered something that straddled the line between feeling fresh and different, but also honored sort of the, the MCU traditions, if you will. Not every filmmaker is able to do it. Like I thought actually, you know, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm obviously a big supporter of Shang-Chi. I thought Destin Cretton did a, a, a very good job of like introducing some crazy off the wall stuff with like through sort of East, you know, kind of East Asian mythology, if you will, yeah. but also still honoring some of the MCU tropes, you know, and kind of keeping you in bounds a little bit at times. So not every filmmaker can do it. Not every filmmaker wants to do it. So if Marvel's going to really hand over the reins, then they just have to accept a wider range of outcomes. But mm. I'm not convinced that they're going to, I don't know. I'm not, they're certainly not going to accept this outcome, I think, again, in this franchise. And I do have to ask the question, which is we've talked about, you know, Kevin Feige, you know, and his, as his empire grows, he was not the lead producer on this. He was not as, he was involved. He's always involved, but he was not the day-to-day. -day. Nate Moore was the lead producer on this. Did that make a difference at some point? You know, if this was phase one and Kevin is probably the person in the room, would this have gone different? Like, those are all things we'll never know. But I think you can ask those questions in light of what we kind of know and what we've seen on screen. Um, because, yeah, I, I think, like I said, I mean, we'll get to, when we get to our star rankings, I'm basically going to asterisk it. I'm going to give my official ranking that I'm going to say, but I think there's a higher ranking possible with what was shot. Yeah. I can't really believe that. Do you think Chloe Zhao saw or have seen all the movies in the MCU? No. Um, I think, to Chloe, I mean, Chloe Zhao also tried to stay true to what Chloe Zhao is, too. And so Chloe yeah. Zhao comes from, you know, one of her big idols is Terrence Malick. And like Terrence Malick is like as abstract and free form and no sense of time. And, you know, he'd, he'd give you a six hour cut of a movie and like, you know, it just and it's like very free flowing like the characters performances are uneven like that it's very hard to watch a Terrence Malick movie because it's just like it's, it's like to me it's like modern art it's like I'm in the museum I know that this piece of art is famous and I know a lot of people really respect it and I'm like I don't totally get it and that's how I always feel yeah. about his films Chloe Zhao has a bit of that that's part of what made her her name and so she's trying to apply that to a 200 million dollar budget movie and at times it works and at times it doesn't so I don't think it's about her watching the MCU or being aware of it. I just think it's about her putting her stamp on a Marvel film, which is what you got, for better or worse. Yeah. Um, do you think... Um, oh, uh, another question. What did you think about this is something I've been struggling with and understanding and you know this all happens after the blip and we don't know what year this really happens do we know all we see is present day it's definitely after the blip because yes. Salma Hayek talks about it um I don't think it's right after the blip but the blip certainly set the stage for the emergence. So I would say we're probably within a couple of years of the blip. So that yeah. would be what, 2000, somewhere between 2024 and like 2030, somewhere around there. Okay. So with this being coming out of the earth, I would imagine there's a lot of chaos going on around the world because you sort of, you know, coming out of the earth and uh, you would think that this earthquake is happening all over the world. That no one else is around for this. I, this is just one of those things you just thought of just throw out. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you had mentioned with Black Widow and nobody's around for this. Um, um, the big fortress in the sky. Yeah, yeah. You know, for this, this is sort of a 
Avengers sort of event, right? Where this this being is coming out of the earth and is seemingly going to destroy the earth if he and no one else was around to to or no one else was available to come in and help out in that situation. This is one of those things you sort of just ask yourself. Do you find yourself thinking about that? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, especially when at the end it's like, you know, it made for like some cool visuals, but you're like. Okay, so there's like a frozen head and like a frozen hand, and like that's just gonna sit there. Like, what are we gonna do? Build a museum? Like, this is like you know, <laughs> celestial yeah. Mount Rushmore. Like, what, what, yeah, yeah, what's yeah. this gonna be? Like, going forward. Yeah, so, yeah and what we've seen in other you. films. Yeah, there's yeah. some questions. There's some questions. Yeah. So. Um, were there anything else within the 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 movie not ex, not the post credit scenes or do you want to get into the post credit scenes or, or is there still any get it. Issue? yeah we can get it i mean no i think that's i think we've i think we've covered it um i think we've covered it i mean i think like i said i, I biggest i mean for me it's weird to say but i think Druig was my mvp i mean i think barry kium was my favorite character in the movie um i know he wasn't the the lead but i, I loved what he did it's funny we haven't talked about Salma Hayek or Kamil Nanjani that much. Um, I mean, Salma Hayek didn't have a lot to do. She was fine. Yeah, um, she was fine. I thought, like Camille had a lot to do in the sense that he was basically had he was the sense of humor of the movie. Yeah. I actually liked his ballet. <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yes. His I was ballet say was it. awesome. That yes, dude was yes, awesome. Yes, yes. He's definitely so a I, I like that. character. Yeah, yeah. He's probably like the the I don't know what you want to call it, like the the guy off the bench that sort of stole the stole yeah. the show. But uh, um, yeah, yeah. Macari is love Macari. Yeah, I thought she was great. I thought the effects. Were... I, I, I think yeah. yes, he was. He was certainly. I think perhaps the best part of that film. Um, I love Dickerus. Um, I like this character. I don't quite get why he had to go into the sun and I don't know kill himself. I think I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I think it's TBD. Are we sure he's destroyed? That's not like totally shown. I think you're led yeah, to believe true, that, but we're true, not sure. So you know. I I just don't understand the purpose. Hope maybe we get a. a I assume it was guilt. I assume he destroyed himself out of guilt or was attempting to. That was the. Yeah, but damn, that that it just seemed a little bit extreme. Because at the end of the day, you know. The Earth was saved. The person that he loves survived, and um, the only thing he sort of should feel more ashamed of, because he was working so hard to maintain the course, is um, failing in his mission um, with with the Celestials, right? Um, but the post credit scenes, yes. What did you think about? I mean, we already know this because people freaking entertainment weekly or or, or E on TV. What's that with, with freaking Mario Lopez? I was watching his ass and he spoiled it for me. Like th- this guy's arrows and stuff. I'm like, damn, you can't, <laughs> you know. So we saw him. Um, again, new rock stars did a, a great explanation as to what he may serve as in, 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 in the, the future of that franchise, the Eternals. Um, but what do you think about his appearance and where do you think this is going? Well, first of all, I've got to give nods to Pip the Troll. That is definitely. Oh, yeah. When I saw him, I was like, expect oh, to see. <laughs> so, Pat Oswalt as Pip yes. the Troll. Yes. Um, Pat Oswalt, who I believe was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., so he's actually a friend of the AMCU already and mm-hmm. uh, you know comes back now as the voice of Pip the Troll. That actually threw me for a loop because they kept that under wraps, all the talk. Oh, about yeah, Harry that was Styles. great. So I kind of was like, whoa, and I actually rec- recognized the voice. Look, I mean, it, it's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I think there's a, there's a big question here looming, which is Eros Thanos. So in the comics, that would, you know, Thanos is actually a deviant, I believe. Yes. That's never has been a, has, a de- has the deviant gene, yes. Deviant gene, right? And that's why they're different. And so is that going to be retconned into the MCU on screen at some point? Like, are we going to get some Thanos backstory to explain Eros as an eternal um, going forward? But no, I'm fine. Like, I, you know, it, it's definitely a character that's, we'll see where Marvel stretches it. But, you know, I mean, it's one of those where it's like, if you're going to do, like as I said, if you're going to do, a little Disney plus sequel and you're going to do it with the, the four or five of them on the ship exploring, looking for other eternal. Great. I'll watch it. Like that sounds yeah. interesting. I'll see where yeah. that goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely am interested in seeing where that goes. And and obviously, you know, Pip the Troll and, and Adam Warlock and, and Arrows all have that connection. So yep. I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that goes because you don't know how this is going to actually work. Right? Um, I'm a little but, worried about the silliness factor just because Adam Warlock is in James Gunn's hands in the yeah. Guardian side. And so you got these guys over here in what was a very dramatic movie. And so I'm kind of a little bit worried about tonally, like if they're going to put them together, how that's going to look and work, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when Arishim says, um, He's going to let that, um, he's going to let the earth survive and this, be, this species live. And, but he's going to, I guess, go back and look at the memories and stuff and, 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 and then arrive, come back for judgment and stuff. Um, and he takes the Eternals, um, which was three of them, which was uh, Fastos, um, Cersei, and. Um, um who did he take? Wasn't Sprite, was not Kingo. Was it Macari that he took? Who was the third that he had? I think Macari. I think Macari. Okay. It wasn't Druig, so, I don't think. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where they went. Um because it seems there's Certain order that they have to follow. We got a glimpse of the living tribunal, right? Um, so we know that they they exist. Again, for me, this movie sort of sets up the, the cosmic um, part of the MCU, which I'm very interested to see. I, I want to get off Earth for a while, and then come back to Fantastic Four, Doom. And, and which I'm pretty sure will be great conversations that we'll have regarding those characters and, and, and Doom especially. But um, Arrows in the comics has been a very um, troublemaking character. Um, so this is going to certainly be very interesting to see in the future where they end up and how they go about this and introducing some of these cosmic entities and what sort of um, judgment um, is made or what trial has to happen, right? Um, to make a judgment on earth, right? What conversations must be had? Must arrows lead his case, right, to, to, to free the other Eternals. Who knows? There's so many ways and directions that they can go with this. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, final post credit scene. What did you think of that? Well, it's cool. They show the Ebony Blade. And so I think we knew we wouldn't yeah. have to get a Black Knight you know, tease. So we got that. I got deeked on the voice. It's not who I thought it was when I left who, the who theater. Did, who, who did you think? I thought it was Jeffrey Wright. And I Most people thought it was. It. it sounded like him, and it sounded like the way he's been playing his voice in What If. So that's yeah. who it sounded like to me when I walked out of the theater. And then, of course, I found out it was that it had actually been confirmed by both Chloe Zhao and Camille Nanjani who it actually was. And I kind of was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. What did you well, that's, it, it tells us that, you know, first Blade is, 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 is fast tracking now. Now we're getting somewhere yeah. with that character. And, 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 and I guess depending on the next few weeks, whether the talks of Blade starts gearing up in a, in a, in a, in a place where they want to sort of fast track and, and get to it, um, it'll be interesting to see um, what more news we get from that revelation. Um, are where... you surprised they admitted it? Like, were you? Do you think that was supposed to be outed? Um, being that it was Chloe Zhao that said it, and who was the other person that said it? Well, I heard Camille Nanjani say it in a, in an interview as well, and then he kind of did the he kind of did the oh I hope I'm not in trouble for saying that. 
if if they were if it wasn't meant to be known, then it puts expectations on Marvel to perhaps deliver to deliver progress on this Blade project. That's what I think it it is it, it most likely is because of the people that said it and because of the reaction that you said he may have had when he did say that about it being Blade. So that's that's my take on that. Yeah. Um so where do you think so what what do you so where do you in terms of stars, what do you give it? So I can only give it two overall, but I do think there's a two out of five. Two out of five. That's all I can give it. I gave Black Widow one and a half. I don't I like this one probably a little bit better than that, but I give it two. But I do think there is like a three and a half star movie in here. I really do. I really do. Wow. Just needed to be cut down and edited and like worked with differently. Mm-hmm. I don't think it can get to four or five for me, just like I said, because of the Gemma Chan issue. I think that central chemistry, it just looks, it felt to me like a miscast, to be honest. And like I, I, that editing doesn't solve. Um, so I think to be at top shelf, they would have needed that. But I do think, you know, three to three and a half, you definitely could get out of this movie, I think, with a tighter edit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'd probably give it a two and a half to three, something like that. Um, yeah. If I had to choose a number, I was struggling with two and a half and three. Um, I would, I, I'll probably stay with two and a half. And, and again, I, I really enjoyed watching this movie. I'm going to go see it again next week. This is one of the few films that I've gone to see twice. I haven't gone to see Black Widow twice. I haven't got you got to see Shang Chi twice, and I know you, Brian. You've seen it several times in the theaters. Yeah, I saw Shang Chi three times, all told, in the theater. I do think, like this movie, definitely has scenes that I want to see again. Yeah, for sure. Like yeah. for sure, it's a long yeah. watch, but there's definitely moments where I'm like, "That's really cool," and I want to see that again. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it next week. Um, so yeah, that is our take on the Eternals film. Um, again, if you want to see um, why most people, I think, didn't like the film, um, or we think that you didn't like the film, um, that you can check out our last show. I, I think it's called, again, Eternals is Whack or whatever. Um, yeah, again, I'll say I'm really interested in seeing where this movie goes. Oh, not in terms of box office, because um, I don't know if word or mouth um will um potentially not have a, a, a humongous drop off in the following weeks um especially this week coming you know um, there's other issues there too you know don't forget uh, the Chloe Zhao tension with China that's also an issue for this movie there's also yeah. several countries that won't show it show it because due of to uh, some specific- of the characterizations so this yeah. movie's box office globally is going to be hamstrung a little bit so. yeah yeah um but yeah that's our take on the eternals um movie um let us know in the comment section what you guys thought uh, of the the eternals film um whether you liked it could have been better did you like it just the way it was um yeah let us know in the comment section below we really do want to hear from you guys um but yeah like you said brian there is a fantastic movie in this um and, and again it will be interesting to see what Marvel or how Marvel treats a talent that they bring in and how much say that they have. Because I, I think we've seen when you give someone or a few too much control over your vision uh, of, of the Marvel brand and the, the entirety of the MCU, you get these issues where People don't really accept it too much as much as you 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 would hope for, you know. But again, again, this movie I liked, I enjoyed very much. I I, I hope to see more. Um, Brian, any last words? No, I think the question as we head toward you know Spider Man No Way Home, which is not totally a Marvel production, but I think this being the first year 
post end game product that we've had on the big screen. I think you'd have to say at best it's uneven. That's been the year we've had. I don't think there's any, you know, I kind of said like Shang-Chi for me, I'm higher on it than most, but it kind of is in my mind close to the top five, but not in the top five, maybe. Um, Black Widow's near the bottom for me. Eternals is probably a, st- a tier up from that, but it's certainly probably in the middle to bottom half of the MCU. So that's not a great showing, quite honestly. If we're being fair to Marvel, that for a year is not awesome coming off of Endgame. And so I know people ask the fatigue question. I would submit a different question, which is, has Marvel already made its best movie? That's not a fatigue question. That's saying, is it possible for them to exceed the excitement and quality of the buildup that led to Endgame? So pick your movie along the way that you loved. But can that ever be surpassed? And I think you don't have to answer it. I just leave it out yeah, there because yeah. I think, like I said, this is the first chance we've had to see them put movies out since that time. And I would say net, net, uneven to slightly disappointed with what we got. I would say, Brian, I want to answer it because I, that is an intriguing question and something that you want to uh, think about it and answer. Uh, and and I and that's one of the questions that I had um, last time that I didn't ask, which was one of the questions of the day. But I just just did that one. Um, but that's a good question. And I I still do think that they can um, get to a place where you get that level of excitement with Endgame and, 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 and uh, Infinity War. There's a bunch of stories that they, they can tell that they haven't told. And, and I think Disney Plus helps along with... Um, not going 10 years and waiting for an infinity war and end game right i think it speeds up the process um but secret wars um the 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 galactus when he comes to, to earth i think there's there's a bunch of stuff that they can tell secret wars there's a bunch of stuff um but i think if they don't rush it um we can get that excitement back um and reach um a level of excitement that we we heard when we saw endgame and infinity war in the, in the theaters um but they can't they can't rush it and again that's why i say spider-man no way home you're gonna get those yells and screams but i think it's gonna be disappointing i think i still think it's gonna be disappointing but again, let us know in the comment section below uh, what you guys think. Um, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report. Remember to hit that like button and, sus- and subscription um, uh, and, and hit that notification bell. We really do appreciate it and help support. And it does help support the channel. And we'll see you next time.